saying. Mostly I cover what's known as the third world, uh, Africa, Asia, Latin America, particularly Africa. Uh, the last couple of years I seem to have been spending most of my time covering wars in Africa. And tonight I should say in advance that I do want to spend a fair amount of time uh, taking a look at the Rhodesian conflict which is going on now and taking kind of a look backwards uh, at the Angola conflict, which I also covered. I also would like to take a look at what's called uh, north-south economic issues. That is to say that the world in, the world very often, especially by journalists, is divided up in lots of different kinds of ways. And one of the kinds of ways uh, in economics that journalists uh, divide up the world is north and south. That is to say, uh, the United States, Western Europe, Soviet Union are generally considered northern nations, uh, rich nations, industrial nations. Uh, the nations of Africa, Asia, Latin America are generally considered or categorized as southern nations, poor nations, underdeveloped nations, or undeveloped nations. I'm not so sure how accurate those definitions are, but they're handy uh, in terms of the time one is given on the radio or the amount of lines one is given uh, in newspapers and magazines. In any case, there is an important issue uh, called North-South issues, which really relate to uh, the conflict over uh, the privileges that have accrued uh, to the northern nations or the nations of Western Europe and the United States at the expense of the development of the uh, nations of the third world. Finally, what I hope to do uh, this evening, or at least get into discussion with you about, is the fact, or at least it's a fact in my own mind, uh, that the underdevelopment, or uh, let me put it this way, that the development of the United States Western nations or northern nations has by and large been at the expense of the development of the nations of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. I think whether we look at it historically or whether we look at it in terms of the kind of politics that's going on in the world today, I think we'd still come out with the same answer, uh, that the United States is a privileged nation uh, a far greater part of the world is underprivileged, and the privileges that exist in the United States uh, are based uh, on the deprivation or the underprivilege of much, of much of the world. Now, I also, throughout all of this, will be talking about how news media actually works or does not work, or what we read about in newspapers or what we see on television or what we listen to on the radio. It's my thesis, my belief, in fact, that what's left out of a news story is probably more important than what goes in. Uh, that the problem with media is that we really don't learn a great deal about the world from it. Uh, I think that dovetails with, uh, with uh, a tendency in the United States in particular uh, not to care much, not to be interested much uh, in the rest of the world, except to the extent that the rest of the world serves uh, uh, American interests. I want to hasten to add that uh, at any point during these remarks, uh, feel free to ask a question, or if what I'm saying is not clear, or you want it to be elaborated on in greater detail, feel free to uh, interrupt and ask me to do that. And uh, I'll be more than willing to do that. OK. Basically, I mean, to get at some of these issues, I think the first thing that we have to deal with is our own frame of reference. That is, what we think about, how we think about things, and who it is that makes us think about things, people, nations, the world uh, uh, around us. Uh, for that matter, essentially what we're asking really is, uh, what is the world around us? That's what I asked as a journalist. I mean, when I go to Rhodesia, as I, that's where I was last year, or Angola, or the Middle East, I mean, the question uppermost in my mind, a question I think that is of fundamental importance 
uh, to people here in the United States whom I report to is, okay, what is the world around us? I mean, is it in fact Washington, D.C., the United States? Is it Baltimore? Is it this prison? Is it Africa, Europe, or uh, what? And it seems to me that uh, depending on how we think about it, the world can either be big or small. Uh, I think as we think about the world, we'll discover that uh, many of the things that structure the world also structure our lives uh, here in the United States. And what I'm thinking about right at this moment is uh, Afghanistan. Uh, President Carter uh, last week uh, imposed a, a grain embargo uh, against Af Afghanistan because the Soviet Union invaded uh, Afghanistan. What interested me about it uh, was that the farmers and many, many of the uh, politicians who have been thundering uh, for the last few months uh, that uh, President Carter should do more, should take a tougher stance to the Soviet Union, uh, should show the U.S. muscle, uh, should demonstrate United States military might, uh, should do all of these things, are taking sharp objection to the fact that uh, these uh, 17 million uh, uh, bushels of grain uh, will not be sold to the Soviet Union. The leader of the one of the uh, unions in Iowa in fact said and that it would be better for the United States to uh, establish military bases uh, in the Middle East and along the Indian Ocean than it would be to cut off corn. The attitude interested me because I, I think it's a fundamental problem uh, in American society that if it cuts into profit, it's not all right. It's better to risk a few lives uh, than it is to cut profit. Everybody wants to be tough against the Soviet Union as long as it does not cut into profit, even on an issue that everybody agrees on, that is that the Soviet Union invaded uh, Afghanistan. I find, <laughs> you know, in covering things everywhere, it, <laughs> this keeps uh, coming up. Uh, be tough as long as you don't cut into what uh, I'm getting. Um, It's clear that what the rest of the world wants and what the rest of the world is doing, a better deal, if you will, uh, structures how we live here. It's clear, it seems to me, if we take a quick look back into history, that the things uh, that have given this country advantage and privilege are now being directly challenged uh, by a great portion of the world. Albert Camus, uh, many, many years ago, raised the philosophical question, uh, can man uh, condemn himself? Camus said no, uh, and wound up, in fact, supporting the French in the uh, Algerian Revolution uh, on that basis. It does seem to me that the same question confronts us here in the United States. The basis of industrial wealth and might in the United States rests on the exploitation of the rest of the world. We cannot talk about underdevelopment in Africa, which is what I want to talk about now, tonight, without talking about colonization in Africa. We cannot talk about colonization in Africa without talking about slavery in the United States. We cannot talk about slavery in the United States without talking about cotton and textiles. We cannot talk about cotton and textiles in the United States without talking about shipping. We cannot talk about shipping without talking about sugarcane, rum, spices, inter-ocean 
interoceanic traffic between the Americas, the East Indies, Africa, the Far East, and uh, so forth. We cannot talk about textiles and cotton. We cannot talk about the very foundation of this society, the foundations, mind you, that have given this country wealth and power, you know, without talking about how it was structured and organized. We cannot talk about how this country was structured and organized without talking about how we've been structured and organized to accept this country. The question is, who has organized our way of thinking about this country? Who has organized our way of thinking about the world? Who has organized our way of thinking about ourselves? Who are we? What are our interests? How do we advance our interests? You know. As a newsman, I have to say that the press that I've contributed to often uh, has not contributed very much uh, to this understanding. Uh, a man named uh, Ron Powers, in a book that I hope uh, you will get here, if you haven't gotten it already, points out uh, that the best American journalism has traditionally proceeded from the assumption that it is mining areas that the public did not even know existed. Uh, but while a muckraking news story is in its muckraking stage, it upsets and annoys people, and it activates hidden fears, hidden biases, and guilts. It might, he might have added, although he didn't, a tough investigative story also challenges the structures of the society in which it's read, heard, or viewed. So within the context of uh, our discussion tonight, some criticism has to be made of the media as a means of controlling ideas uh, at a time in which the world is shrinking, becoming more complex, in which there's a need for a literal explosion uh, of ideas. We live in a world in which everything is defined as property. We also live in a world in which the dominant fact is world war. For the last 35 years, the world has been engaged in conflict. There has, has been, I would argue, a world war going on. Not on the order of World War I or World War II, but there has been a definite and definable conflict going on between the various groups of people who for 100, 200, or 300 years, in the case of black people in the United States, have been structured to serve one set of interests and who are trying to come to grips with a way to define and serve their own interests. If you want to get to the roots of the crisis in Iran, it's there. You know, if you want to get to the roots of the crisis in the Middle East, it's there. Or if you want to get to the roots of the crisis in Rhodesia and Southern Africa, it's there. Yet it's hard to see. One doesn't have to be a journalist to realize that uh, we see and discard, we throw away more of what we see than we actually use. Uh, in another book that I hope uh, you'll get a chance to read if it hasn't been ordered, it's called Black Fire, which is an account of the uh, guerrilla struggle in uh, Rhodesia or Zimbabwe. Uh, they are detailed illustrations uh, of the conflict between guerrilla fighters who, as cadre, as men on the ground, so to speak, uh, begin to perceive substantively and in detail the need for struggle, the need for organization in Rhodesia. And their commanders, 
who see the guerrillas as instruments to be used uh, as diplomatic pawns on a larger stage outside of uh, Rhodesia in the United Nations, uh, in the foreign ministry of uh, Britain. Yeah. Well, he... Oh. Good evening. The individuals that you are speaking of, did you have an opportunity to speak to them? The or to the, interview them, the to find out their opinions, how they felt, and so forth? Yes, I did. There's lots, would you, let me get at it this way. Yes, I, I spent a good chunk of last year in Rhodesia talking to people who were associated with the guerrillas and people who weren't. Uh, I also spent a fair amount of time in countries around Rhodesia talking, and, and for the most case, guerrillas, persons who are associated with one or the other uh, of the guerrilla movements. And one of the questions I was interested in, quite frankly, uh, was, okay, how is a movement organized? I mean, presume they didn't spring up full blown in 1978 or 1979 right. uh, with gun in hand. Uh, uh, ready to wage war against Ian Smith, uh, the Prime Minister of Rhodesia. There was a long organizational history in front of that. And one of the, issue, one of the descriptions that doesn't get in the American press very much because guerrillas like black people in the United States or Latinos or Chicanos or poor people generally in the United States are just chumped off. Uh, as in, in the case of Rhodesia as terrorists, uh, in the case of much of the United States uh, as sort of ignorant, irrelevant uh, criminals. Uh, in getting and talking with them about it, one of the question, the question I was trying to get at was, since I wanted to understand what the guerrillas wanted, I wanted to know where they were coming from. I wanted to know how they got where they were in 1978 and 1979. Mm -hmm. And this really gets to one of the themes I hope we can talk about a lot tonight, and that is how people think about themselves. Because as it turned out, for several years, what the leadership, now here I'm talking about the African leadership of Rhodesia thought, was that by mounting fairly minor protests that would generate enough pressure to convince Britain in particular to persuade the white people who ran Rhodesia to change their minds and turn it over to the Africans. That was the notion. Uh, there was no really deep-seated belief that they'd have to engage in protracted, long-term guerrilla struggle, long-term organization that would stretch out over a number of years. What happened was that some of the first groups that began to undergo training, military training, to engage uh, in warfare in Rhodesia, had to confront the question of how they were going to survive once they crossed the border inside Rhodesia. And what that meant was they had to confront how they were going to translate to people inside Rhodesia what they were about. Uh, the first groups that went into Rhodesia were defeated, almost without exception. The very first groups that, that went across the borders, and here I'm talking about between 1965 and 1970, uh, the Crocodile Gang, the Wanki uh, Alliance, and a variety of other groups that crossed the border. One after the other as they crossed the border, the most famous defeat was the Wanki defeat. And I'll tell you why they were defeated. What happened was it was a, a big alliance. Uh, 
the Rhodesian guerrillas were going to be allied with the South African guerrillas, and they were going to start from Zambia and sweep all the way down to the southern tip of Africa. Now, what they did was they got to the Zambezi River, and from the Zambian side, which is independent Africa, held a press conference. And they called in the BBC, the British Broadcasting Company, the Canadian Broadcasting Company, and the wire services were called in. And they announced that they were leaving from this point at the Zambezi River, and they were going to lead an army into Rhodesia, defeat the Rhodesians, and keep going until they got to South Africa. Of course, this was played on televisions of Europe. Uh, and I don't know about America. I saw it in Europe. Uh, picked up by the wires. Uh, and when they crossed the river, the South Africans and the Rhodesians uh, were waiting for them. And they got totally defeated. Well, my point is it sparked a major debate, an internal debate, a major internal debate about what we want and how we have to go about getting it. That's what it sparked. And it set up a conflict, quite frankly, between the leadership, which had planned this campaign in a fairly unrealistic way, and the people who were expected to fight who saw themselves you know, being defeated uh, because of bad planning. And what the people who were expected to fight did then was raise questions with the leadership. And they said, if you want to make a war for independence, it's going to take a lot more than a press conference or and they didn't say it in quite these terms, uh, if you're serious about independence, then you cannot use us as, rather cynically, as pawns in some diplomatic game that you're playing uh, by sending us across the river, by telling television crews that we're going across the river and getting it filmed you can now go to London or the United Nations or to Paris or to Washington and say, we are leading a guerrilla struggle. Our men have just crossed the Zambezi River. Didn't you see it on CBS? Uh, go ahead. You want to? My point is, like you said, you were speaking of the World War. Well, okay. I think the same thing is being. Uh, since the, go ahead. I'd like to know what type of effect or impression that you make of them coming from America, representing the American black man. Because during the summer, I ran across a couple of brothers who was from Africa, and they was practically begging blacks to come over there. Now, it's, you know, it's apparent to me that the journalists are not revealing the uh, truth about what is, what is really occurring over there. I don't think it can. And I feel as though before you print anything that it's being screened by someone or some secret force. It's not so secret. It's obvious, because you've also mentioned Iran. See, we do not know what's occurring in Iran. We have an idea of what's occurring. We see the, the confusion that's coming about today. Because in the beginning, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini was successful. Now there's a lot of conflicts. Where is it coming from? Internal conflicts. OK, I want to give you two examples. See, but we only know what is being printed through the news media. OK. Which is a propaganda machine. Two things. Well, first, a general theme, which everybody here should understand if they don't understand. Major news media, whether it's radio, television, or newspaper, and when I say major news media, I mean the news, in the news gathering institutions that can afford to send journalists overseas for long periods of time, allegedly to report the world. Our major corporations in this country, I mean, we're not, don't expect news media, news agencies to somehow be isolated and, and, and separate, purer, less interested 
uh, in the interest of the countries that they sit in. We're talking about the Washington Post, the New York Times, the television networks, the major radio networks, the major magazines, you know, in addition to talking about institutions of information gathering and information presentation, we're also talking about very significant parts of the economic structure of this country and the political structure and the social structure of this country, which is under attack in many, many corners of the world. And the fact of that conflict, the fact of that attack, colors or affects what you see, read, or hear. That's the principle, first, I want you to keep in mind. Secondly, two examples, one from the states, one from overseas. In 1961, students uh, decided that in addition to making protests against lunch counter segregation uh, in southern states, that some of them needed to leave school and go south and organize on plantations and organize in the back counties of Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, and Louisiana. And they did that for three years without it essentially being reported in the news media. Uh, Hotting Carter, who is now the uh, press spokesman uh, for Cyrus Vance, the uh, Secretary of State, at that time ran the Delta Democratic Times newspaper uh, in Greenville, Mississippi. Uh, Ralph McGill, uh, who has been close to Jimmy Carter at that time, was running the Atlanta Constitution and uh, so forth. Very little information was getting into the media until the activities that were occurring in the South started to threaten the country itself. It's, and it's interesting what this country decided was threatening because over those early years, there were a number of black people getting killed. Over, over the years, uh, state structures and county structures and district structures were thrown against black organizers essentially, just in the grossest violation of constitutional rights. That never really merited a great deal of publicity. Two things merited publicity. Direct challenge, i.e. sit-ins, freedom rides. And finally, the killing of white people, which Change attitude. It, it didn't count for anything. Never has. Can't you, see the impact of you can see the impact of it. The question is not what you think is the impact of it or what I think is the impact of it or what we think should have been reported in 1961, 1960, or 62. The question is specifically what got in or did not get in to a newspaper what got on or did not get on television, why didn't it? What were the people who own or edit these things thinking about? That's the question. Iran, the resentment has existed in Iran in terms of the Shah for years and years and years. Persons who've been following and covering the Middle East have been predicting an explosion in Iran for years, the fact that the Shah of Iran killed and tortured thousands has been no big secret to anybody that's been to the Middle East or been no big secret to anybody that's bothered to talk to Iranians. Probably the best file on Iran and what's been happening in Iran over the last half a dozen years exists at WHUR radio in Washington. They've been covering it. They've talked over the years to every, just about every single Iranian 
that can be gotten hold of. They've got a record of it. They can list, if you could go back through the six years of their tapes, of their existence, you'd find all the ugly horror that equals, say, what Jews in concentration camps in Nazi Germany or in Poland and, and the like talk about. Question is, why didn't any of that stuff get in the media? What were the people who decide what gets in or doesn't get in thinking about? You know, and the parallel question is, if all these, all of this knock of events in Iran or in Rhodesia or in the Black Belt South existed and were going on and we couldn't get access to it, then we have to say, when we witness the kind of explosion in Iran, or we witness, you know, a successful liberation struggle, say, in Mozambique. So do you say. I think it's, it's, I think it's been successful in Mozambique. But the question, the, the parallel question is not only why didn't it get in and who decided to, to keep vital information out. The parallel question is what's happened to us uh, and what's, what are we missing by not having that information? What's happened to our own minds? See, I was in California when the hostages were taken in Iran on sort of a holiday. Uh, it's a funny thing about California. I hope nobody's here from California, but I find it's a funny thing about California. Not an awful lot of news uh, gets out there, even dramatic stuff like the Iranian thing. And I had no sense of how people generally in this country were reacting to the Iranian situation till I came back east. Now, they had a demonstration to free the hostages in Iran, in Washington, at the Capitol. The sign that struck my attention in that, and the one I've been trying to figure out what the implications of it are, is the sign that someone had that said, feed Iranians to starving Cambodians. Now, I'm trying to figure out how, I mean, aside just from the flat horror of the notion itself, I'm trying to figure out what somebody could be thinking, you know, when they, hold, I mean, that's lynch mob fever operating here. I mean, to hold that kind of sign there. And you can take exception, you can disagree with the holding of hostages uh, in Iran, but you shouldn't be unable to understand the anger of Iranians at America. The reason people, but you find that people don't understand the anger of Iranians at Americans, or the anger of South Africans at Americans, or the anger of Rhodesians at Americans, or the general anger of the third world to the, to the West, or the general resentment of the third world to the West. You find the people talking about your average citizen in the United States don't understand that. So one problem I raise is a problem of the vehicles that we're dependent upon for information, for awareness and consciousness. And I say, and as I think that through, I say that the problem isn't so much that a story that you read in a newspaper or that a news story that you see on television or hear on the radio is inaccurate on its face. It will tell you some little bit of who, what, when, where, and how. The problem is all the things that are left out. Uh, the things that they choose to put in are by and large factual in many cases, but they don't contribute to our understanding because a whole nother set of things uh, needs to be put in. So the question is, why aren't they put in? Why, for instance, 
food is a major problem in the world. It shouldn't be. I mean, actually, the world should be able to feed itself. Uh, lots of fertile land, lots of people with agriculture. It doesn't. I suspect, quite frankly, and know it on little evidence besides experience, uh, that there's a conflict of interest, say, in, in food. Uh, if the West African Sahel produced enough food for itself, could feed itself, let's put it as crudely as I can. If the West African Sahel could feed itself, produce enough food for itself, what would happen to the companies that supply food to the West African Sahel? The American companies, the Canadian companies, the British companies. It's a major conflict of interest. You know, and I can talk about it to you here, but you won't read about it in the New York Times or the Washington Post or see it on CBS News. Uh, and so forth. And I want to keep coming back to why not. 